The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 12th chapter. Glory Glory to you, Lord. Lord. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two, and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son, and son against father. Mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, It's going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, There will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites! You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. In today's reading from Hebrews and from Luke, both can be a little shocking. We hear, hear of people who achieved a great thing in faith. The reading from Hebrews tells of those who in their faith also received torture, mocking, flogging, imprisonment, and on and on. Luke is not much better for our comfort either. Jesus previously in this chapter, and for some chapters preceding, gives a message of peace reconciliation, healing, and comfort. His parables show the weak, the mild, the marginalized of society coming out on top, getting their fair share. But now, now Jesus seems pretty upset. He's pretty upset as he's speaking to those around him. But we have to ask, what is the context that Jesus is speaking to and how does this apply to us today? During the biblical times of Jesus, both the Hebrews and the Greeks, in their worlds, a person was defined by the family association. Many know Jesus as a son of a carpenter. And this is a tough mold for Jesus to break out of, as seen in, even in his own hometown. The identity of people in the biblical times is made up by how you perceive yourself in relation to your family and how others perceive you in relation to your family. If one is poor and a beggar, they're apt to remain poor and a beggar. There's not a university for someone to go to and learn and better oneself and get some American dream or any other dream. The ministry of Jesus is radical. The entire social structure, the entire political structure is turned on its side by what Jesus asks his followers to do. Jesus has a promise. A promise to deliver to the people. A promise to deliver to the people in the new covenant of his body and his blood. And when people begin to do as they're called to do by Jesus in faith of the promise people, people also get upset. Jesus, throughout his parables, teaches ideas that are so contrary to the social norms that people must have been just shaking their heads in total disbelief. I want you to think back for a moment now. Think of some of the parables 
that Jesus had called with some unexpected results. Crisscrossing through the Gospels, the Good Samaritan, the workers who get paid the same wages for working one hour or all day, the rich fool that I preached on two weeks ago, the product of son. Each of these and others twist a social understanding on top of its heads. But Jesus isn't done. He takes it further. He takes it further by redefining who are his brothers and sisters in Matthew 12. He defines his family as those that do the will of the Father as his brothers, his sister, and mother. No longer does blood define the family. Now, it's now when we look at the gospel, we can see where it's getting at. We see division. Yes, division. Because people are not getting what Jesus is telling them. Social and political structures are upheaved. People do not see the kingdom of God. Then, and even today, many do not see the kingdom here and now. Let me read to you again from the last part of the gospel today. When you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it's going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, there will be, you say there will be a scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but you, why do you not know how to interpret the present time? People that Jesus is speaking to, they can predict the weather, yet they cannot see what is going on right in front of their own noses. Jesus, Jesus the Christ is there. The kingdom has broken through. And they cannot or will not see what Jesus has to offer to them in a promise of himself. A promise of himself as the son of the Father, the God most high. So how does that apply to us today? What are we to do? Are we as blind as those that just heard Jesus in that day? The Father. The Father, for the sake of the Son, gives each and every one of us, you, me, all of us, gives each and every one of us faith through hearing the Word. The Holy Spirit imparts faith upon us by us hearing the Word. That's right. Because we hear what Jesus, the Word, has done, is doing, and will do for us. His promise. We receive faith. Faith in the promise of Christ. But now that we have that faith, now that we receive that faith, what are we to do with the faith? Faith. If you really have the hope in the good news of Christ Jesus, we can't just stuff it in our pocket. We can't put it in a box, put it up on a shelf and tuck it away someplace. That makes faith nothing more than an object. Faith nothing more than a thing. That makes faith a noun. That's not what faith is. Faith requires so much more of us. Faith is a verb. Faith requires action because it itself is action. Faith is actively trusting. Actively trusting in a promise in God's Son. You, me, each and every one of us, 
each and every person who takes on the identity, the identity in a family as a brother or sister with Christ must do more than just take faith and store it away and keep it as a mountain. In Hebrews, we hear of all sorts of things that are being done through and in faith. We must tell others. Bring a word to others so that the Spirit may impart faith on those that hear the word. Oh, yes. Here it comes. It's that scary, nasty, ugly, terrifying, gut wrenching word I'm about to use evangelism. Oh, no. Evangelism. That is a scary word, especially for Lutherans. Evangelism. We actually might have to act upon and with our faith, not only in telling others, but through our actions to our own neighbors, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and, and not only to our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also to those that will become our brothers and sisters in Christ. Those that do not believe yet, but will believe because of our actions and because of hearing the word. Yes. We are going to hear some awful things. And we've heard some awful things that happen to the faithful. And to be honest, it is still happening today. We are fortunate, however, here to live in the United States. It would be a pretty rare case indeed that we will be stoned for keeping our faith as a verb. It would be pretty rare indeed that we'll be sawed in two because of our faith. Or killed by the sword because of our faith. Or even imprisoned because of our faith if we keep faith a verb in action. But it does happen. It happens in Iran. It happens in parts of Africa. It can happen in China. It can happen in other parts of the world. It doesn't happen here. But oh yeah, something does happen. Someone might say, no thanks. You're a nut. Get away from me. I don't want to hear about God. They might, worse yet, they might laugh. And that is so much worse than all the other things that we've heard. Not. Never. Never will we promise that everything would be a bed full of roses if we lived out our faith. Just because we're faithful to God doesn't mean everything goes hunky-dory. God is, however, always with us in our faith. And thus God is active, and we need to be active in our faith, and keep faith as a verb, not as a noun. Keep it active. Yes. There's still going to be tough times. But it's in those tough times that God is the closest. God is the most active. And if we look if we look, we can see the kingdom of God breaking through. You may have heard some say, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. That's one way of looking at it, like turning things around. Turning things around. When I was growing up, I remember a book that came out by an author called Irma Bombay. It was called, If Life is a Bowl Full of Cherries. What am I doing in the pits? Life is sweet like cherries. But there are pits. And we cannot have the sweetness of life without the pits. Just like we cannot have cherries without pits. Keeping our faith as a verb and responding to God, we have the promise of God in Christ Jesus that we will receive the sweetest promise of all. Eternal life. Eternal life though with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. How little, how little we need to do. For how much 
God does and will do for us. How little. So today, when you hear the words, go in peace, proclaim the good news, take your faith off the shelf. Take it out of the box. Take it out of your pocket. Go forth and go and do 